right, chapter four, making decisions. Well, we already know how to do if statements by the time you get to this class. So we're probably not going to spend a huge amount of time on this chapter. But there are some uh, twists and turns to doing it. Spe one thing specifically involving switch statements, which if you've seen in C++ or Java are very useful things, and the one in C Sharp behaves a little bit differently. It's a little bit more nailed down in the way that it works. It does not support fall through, if uh, you remember what fall through is. But yet, even though it does not support fall through, you still have to put the break keyword in it. And if you've never seen switch statements, none of that makes sense, but it will pretty soon. All righty. So decision making is, in fundamentals, you called it selection. Those are the ifs or the if elses, or you can chain them together with if else if else if else if. Using compound expressions and if statements probably means using ors and ands, and then making decisions with switch statements. All right, I'm skipping what pseudocode is, what flowchart is, and what sequence structure is. Sequence structure is just when you have a series of commands. You're giving somebody instructions and you give them a list of commands on how to get there. But with the decision, right, you know, Highway 51 is closed. And so you tell the person an alternate way to go so that they don't have to call you or pull up a map or whatever. Yeah, I don't think you could give uh, somebody a list of instructions that had every possible way, but it's just an example. Is the back way, expressway backed up? Yeah, then you better go, you know, down the road instead of getting on the highway or whatever. So we have our sequential statements and we have our decision making one there. This would be a simple if else block. So decision structure involves choosing between alternative courses of action. All computer courses or uh, decisions are essentially yes or no decisions when reduced to their most basic form. Now there's something called fuzzy logic where uh, you know the different possibilities are rated and then the decision is made. But still, ultimately, when that decision is made, unless it's just a random number picking it for you, then it's going to boil down to a yes-no, you know, regardless of how the fuzzy logic rated everything to come up with the most likely solution. So making decisions using the if statement. That's called a single alternative decision if you don't have an else. You can either put one statement subordinate to it, or you can put a block using curly braces. If it's only one statement, you can still put a block with curly braces. And the if expression that precedes the block of code is the control statement for the decision structure. I've been calling it the expression or the conditional expression, but this book wants to call it the control statement. That's like if a equal equal three, well the if statement is the keyword, but a equals equals three is the control statement. Or as I would call it, the conditional expression. So is number less than five? Yeah, write A. And then write B. So if we were cruising down here and number was in fact less than five, then it would write A, B. But if number was not less than five, if this expression was false, it would just print B. Now this is messed up. Here we put a semicolon here. And in general, anytime you put a semicolon before you start indenting a line of text or before you put a curly brace, you blow the statement up. You break the statement. Why? Because that ends the statement right there. And so even though this is indented, this isn't Python where indention matters, right? So it does this comparison, and regardless of whether number is less than 5 or not, it does nothing because nothing is following the if statement. And then it'll do A and B regardless of whether this condition was true or false. And that's what the flowchart is illustrating. Is number less than five? Yeah, sure, do nothing. There's no else clause, so there's nothing else to do anyways. And then do A and B. So that breaks the code. And the same is true for for statements. Never put a semicolon after your for statement. Always have a line of code or a block of code underneath it without a semicolon in front of it. 
And of course, that's different from Python, where every if statement or every while statement had a colon after it, so your fingers may be trained to wish that you could type something there, but don't. This is a different language. Obviously, you can put more than one statement nested subordinate to the if statement. You just put them in blocks, in braces. If you leave off the braces, then that makes only the first statement controlled by the if. So this statement, right line C, is controlled by the if statement, but then right line D happens no matter what. Don't be fooled by the indention. The indention is wrong, but you know you don't have to indent your code at all in this language. It's purely controlled by the structures. And so what it would do is if number is less than 5, it would write C, but D would happen regardless due to the lack of braces. So a nested if, one decision after another, one within another. You pretty, pretty much already have the idea, and you do not have to type this, right? You don't have to type this in your code. But if you do this, if A is equal to zero, inside it you could nest something else. If B is equal to zero. And then inside that, you know, this is obviously not C-sharp syntax, print, both are zero, right? Kind of a horrible combination of Python and one of the C-based languages. So anyways, you can do that. The only time this will work is if this was true. Now honestly, whenever you see nested ifs, think, can I replace that with an and statement? Which would look like this. If a equals zero and, and you actually use double ampersands rather than the word and, like you can in some languages, but in all the C-based languages there, uh, including C-sharp and Java, you use double ampersands. So if A is equal to zero and B is equal to zero, print both are zero. Like that. That's how I would do it, rather than use nested ifs. Now sometimes nested ifs are necessary. If the logic inside the braces is more complex than just a single line of stuff, Right, we might have an else here, you know, and we might do something else, you know. If A is equal to zero but B is not equal to zero, then there's something else we're going to do, right? We could not duplicate that with just a simple and. But if it can be, I'd recommend you use and. But this brings up a topic, something that uh, is mentioned later, called short circuiting. Short circuiting is when the compiler can write code so that part of the evaluation is skipped if it's not necessary to do it. And in this case, you can see that this comparison just flat out does not happen if this one is false, right? It doesn't go into this block and then do that comparison anyways. It knows, you know, if this is false, it just skips down to the end of the block. Well, when you use an AND, it's the same way. This is evaluated, and since AND means if both of them are true, if this one's false, we've already ruled out the whole thing. And so the, uh, the compiler codes it so that this block, or this expression, is skipped if, that, if this one is false. So if the first expression or operand of an AND is false, the second one is skipped. That's known as short-circuiting. And usually it just works, you know, it just works. Uh, sounds like a Mac campaign or something like that. Um, usually you don't have to think too much about it. But if you're trying to optimize the performance of your code, there's something to consider. Do you want to put the one that takes the most amount of time first or the one that takes the least amount of time first? If this was calling a function that took five seconds to do and this one was calling a function that took two seconds to do, right? I would not want to put the most expensive one first. Why? Because the first one is always executed. And so we could rule out our situation by doing the less expensive one first. I would put the less expensive one first, right? I would say B is equal to zero and A is equal to zero like that, so that it only calls the more expensive check if the first one has been done. 
that is a form of optimization. That's re the reason that short circuiting is implemented so that you could optimize your code. Because every comparison you do takes some finite amount of time. Now nowadays computers do, you know, billions of operations per second or whatever, but still, finite amount of time, especially if you're calling functions rather than just simple, you know, comparisons. That's one time. The other is if one of them happens more frequently than the other. Like if I have this, if, you know, hungry and I have money, then my classic example, like that. What if I'm hungry all of the time, but I only rarely have money? Well, that means that this one happens more often. That means that both of these are going to be checked 90% of the time or whatever. However often I'm hungry, the second check has to be done. But say I only have money 10% of the time. If I put that one first, then the second one is evaluated only 10% of the time rather than 9% of the time. So your rules of thumb are, for short circuiting, the first expression, or operand, should be the one that is true the least often, or the one that is least expensive in, in terms of time or resources. Like if one of them has to hit the disk and the other one not. You would not want to access the disk unless you knew everything was set up correctly. Right. So if it had to hit the disk to find out whether I was hungry or not, we'd want to make that one second rather than hit the disk every single time. If we can only do it some of the time, we get a performance improvement. So least expensive in terms of computing resources such as processor time or I.O. usage. OR statements also do short circuiting, by the way. But OR statements are more like if-else statements. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's an example of nested ifs. If the number is greater than low, then we check to see if it's between high or less than high. And if that was also true, we would write number is between low and high. And here's that expressed in code. Now what this is doing is this is doing a check to see if something is within a range. You typically use AND statements to check to see if something is within a range. Like, right, if x is less than low and x is greater than high, well, that was stupid. I goofed that one up completely. If x is greater than low or greater than equal to low, and x is less than or equal to high, then that means it's inclusive inside the range. Print. It's within the range. Right? So you use ands to check to see if something is within the range. Or you use nested ifs. But if you can use an and rather than a nested if, I suggest you use the, uh, the and. Makes the code cleaner, easier to read, in my opinion. What if you want to check to see if something is outside of the range? So use and to check to see if something falls within a range. Conversely, use or to check to see if something falls outside a range. Like this. If x is less than low, or two vertical bars, x is greater than high, then print it's outside the range, or it's not within the range. Right? That makes sense? If we were going, nah, I'll get back to that when we hit else's. So a note on comparisons. Never do this. I don't even think the compiler will allow you to do it. The C and C++ compilers do. But never do if C is equal to 0. Print something. What does that do? Does it check to see if C is equal to 0? No, since this is the assignment operator, it erases the value of C. Replaces it with 0. 
and then this happens only if the result is non-zero. Well, in this case, it'll never be non-zero because zero gets copied into C, so the result is zero, would never print anything. Now, if we change this to something non-zero, if C is equal to one, well, again, that's the assignment operator, not comparison, so C is erased, replaced with one, and since this is non-zero, it does that no matter what. So not only have you erased your data, you've triggered something no matter what when you only want it to happen part of the time. So what are you going to do? You're going to use double equals. Never use single equal to perform a comparison. Use double equals. And like I said, I'm not even sure C-sharp allows it. Probably not. Java forbids that. The compiler chokes syntax error. Right, but it works in C and C++. It's happy to let you screw your data up. So dual alternatives. If else is the project under budget, we get a bonus. Else, we don't get a bonus. And we know what's coming up next, a flow chart. Is the project under budget? Yeah, print, you know, they get a bonus, else they don't get a bonus. And that's not what this one says. If number is greater than high, print the number is greater than high. Else, print the number is not greater than high. So, here's my other point about replacing nested ifs with ands. You can replace if elses in certain circumstances with ors, like this. If here was our example. We were checking to see if x was less than low or x is greater than high. If x is less than low, print, it's outside of range. And then we had else if x is greater than high, print, it's outside of range. We have multiple selections doing the same thing, and they're chained together with else ifs. If you do that, just replace it with an or, right? If x is less than low or x is greater than high, then print outside of range. So if you have multiple if, else, ifs with the same result, see if you can combine them into a single statement chained with an or. Now, you can't chain them all together because what if these were, you know, mutually exclusive choices. Like if x is less than low, print something else. If x is equal to low, then print something else, you know, barely in range, you know, else if whatever, you know, x is equal to high, again, print that message, rarely in range, and else if x is greater than high, then print, it's outside of range. We could simplify this with ORs, but not just with one statement like we did here. Here we have two duplicate conditions. X is less than low, it prints that. X is greater than high, print that. You would combine those with an OR, right? If X is less than low or X is greater than high, then we would print it's out of range. I need to cut this and paste this. And, well, I, I think I've messed it up. Anyways. But then we have two others that produce identical results. So else if x equals low or x equals high. Then we would print barely in range. And notice that if none of these are true, then we don't print anything. Is that okay? Well, yeah, maybe it's okay. But maybe you wanted to print something under every circumstance, in which case you need a final trailing else. And if none of the above is true, we're going to say it's within range. Right. Same is true down here. Right. If that's not true and that's not true, do we want to see some message or none? Well, that's your decision. I always recommend putting in a final else, even if you think it's an impossible condition to reach. And just print an error message if that's the case, right? 
because it could be that you've written your logic wrong or somebody comes in and changes it so that neither one of these will happen, although you always thought it would. And so always put a trailing else if you have a list of ifs, else, ifs, even if you don't think it's possible for it to get there because somebody may break it or you may have made a mistake and it is possible for it to get there. And I'm not going to take the time to write an example of that. Just accept it on faith, pretty please. Always put a trailing else if you have if, else, ifs. So you can combine multiple decisions with ands and ors. Now you don't, you don't use the word and, you don't use the word or, right? You use ampersand, ampersand, and vertical bar, vertical bar, shift backslash, the one above the inner key. So if it's the AND operator, both expressions have to be true. Use two ampersands and UST include a complete Boolean expression. What does that mean? How about we remove the word UST? I think it's supposed to be just. I think so. All right. So anyways, AND means both sides have to be true. Right? I am hungry and I have money. That's the only time I'm going to go to the restaurant. These will probably be expressions, but they could be single Boolean variables. Truth tables show the relationship between ands and ors. And you can create truth tables that are longer than just x and y. You could make a truth table for x and y or z. You know, it would have three columns and more than just, you know, four options. You probably have seen truth tables in your earlier classes, so I'm not going to set the time to type one out. And here it's explaining short circuit evaluation. So if you didn't get it when I mentioned it, read up on it. Here's the true table for x and y. The only time that the result is true is if both inputs, both operands, both expressions are true. Any other time it's false. And when do you use them? To replace nested ifs. The conditional or operator written as two pipes. Only one or the other one, or both, have to be true, right? I am sick or tired. I'm going to stay home. I don't have to be sick and tired, according to this company, which is incredibly lax. I can stay home if I'm sick or tired. So if I'm sick, yay, stay home. If I'm tired, yay, stay home. If I'm both, that's what you use or for. You also use it to replace multiple else's that give you the same result, as I previously mentioned. And both sides have to be complete Boolean expressions, whether it's a single variable or whether it's an entire expression. And again, there's short circuit evaluation, where if the first expression is true, oh, I didn't mention short circuiting for or. Works slightly different. So if the first expression of AND is false, the second one is skipped, but OR is different. If sick or tired. If we're sick, do we even need to bother to check tired? No, because the expression is already true, and OR means that only one side has to be true. So short-circuiting says that if this one is true, the compiler will write code so that the second expression is skipped. So, if the first expression of an OR is true, the second one is skipped. Why am I skipping these? Because you have used ANDs and ORs in other programming languages. If this is your first programming language, read the book carefully. Now the switch statement. Switch statements let you set up things like this. If you had a whole bunch of else's, if year is equal to one, print freshman, else if year is equal to two, do sophomore, else if year is equal to three, do junior, else senior, else invalid year. Now notice that they've done something dumb. They've tabbed this out like that. Just put the else and the if on the same line and don't do this weird tabbing. But anyways, it's, it's valid code. Right, but it's kind of silly looking. 
Anyways, we have all these mutually exclusive choices. Year is equal to 1, do something. Year is equal to 2, do something else. So, we can rewrite that. We switch on our variable. And then we list a bunch of cases. If case 1, that matches that one. We write freshman. If case 2, that matches the sophomore case. Case 3, that's the junior case. Case 4 is the senior case. And default replaces the idea of the final trailing else. All right, is there any reason to use switch? All it does is make the code tidier. In this particular language, unlike the ones that support fall through, which I'm just going to mention again, there is nothing you can do with a switch that you cannot do with if else ifs. It's just a matter of whether you think the code is cleaner or not. The one thing that this implies, is, or not implies, it dictates that the choices are all mutually exclusive. So you don't have to look at the logic of this as carefully as you have to look at the logic of this, right? We might, you know, if some of these chase conditions are not mutually exclusive, we would not have been able to express it as a switch. So the fact that we see it as a switch means that every outcome is mutually exclusive, meaning that one and only one of them will happen by the time it's done evaluating it. So it's, it's easier to read, supposedly. It, it guarantees that there's only one you know, solution, one outcome for all possible values of that variable. So it, it, it uh, dictates structure, a cleaner structure, but is it necessary? No. That's why some languages don't even include switch statements, but a lot of them do. All of the children of the C language do. Now, one thing about the switch statement, this is different than the other languages you may have learned, is that there's no fall through. And first, I'm going to explain what fall through is, and then I'm going to say that it doesn't work. Right, so fall through works like this. If we switch on the A variable, and then we have a case, case one, we were supposed to do something, print one. And we have to put a break there, or when I say we have to, it's the way we do it if we want mutually exclusive outcomes. If case was equal to 2, we would print 2, break. And then default, if none of the others are true, we print 3. So if we were going to trace this code, and you can put a break after a default, but not strictly necessary because it's going to break anyways, right, after that. So break just kicks it out of the structure. Once it prints out 1, it goes to the end of the switch statement, and whatever's down here, you know, print done, happens. So let's trace it through. If A did equal 1, what is it going to print? It's going to print 1, if A is equal to 1. If it's 2, it's going to print 2, and then break. Well, it's going to print 1, and then it's going to print done. If A is equal to 2, it's going to print 2, and then done. And I'm doing this for a reason, not just to be spending my time typing. If a is anything else, like 3, if, uh, 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 is going to print done. Now that's with those break statements. What if we took a break statement out? Like that one. Well, let's trace it through. If A is equal to 1, it prints out 1, but there's no break to stop it from coming down here. So it will also print out 2. So in that case, it would print out 1, 2, done. What if we took that one out as well? Then it would print out one, two, three, done. Now what would it say if it was a two? Well, it would jump to here, right? It would print two. But then it would also fall through to print three. Now what if it was a value other than one or two? It triggers a default case. In that case, it prints three and done. And there are very, very occasionally times when you might want to fall through. Well, too bad. C-sharp doesn't give you the option of fall through. They just made a decision, and people have complained about it, but it's Microsoft's call, that no fall through exists. It's a syntax error if you leave out the word break. Now, what's crazy is that if you don't, if you're not allowed to leave out the break, then they could have just said, that if there's no break, it breaks there anyways, right? But they didn't do that. They mandate the break and then say that they... Anyways, you see what I mean? If, But then that would change the code. 
the code would behave differently between C Sharp and C++ or Java. And I guess they wanted to preserve the syntax but make it mandatory to have the breaks. Now I'm going to delete this stuff about one, two, three, done. Well, maybe I could just copy it again and then remove the breaks. No, because I don't want to encourage people to try to do fall through in a language that doesn't support it. Now, why did I explain you something that it doesn't do? Because the very first slide says no fall through rule. So apparently they considered important, and it is. So you have to use a break statement at the end of each case. And we are far enough into this that we could go and we could look at our little tutorial. One thing about switch statements is it has to be an integer type. Some languages will let you switch on strings. No language will let you switch on a floating point value as far as I, I know. But it has to be an integer type. Now the integer type could be an enum. Let's go and check the tutorial. All right, this one has a code snippet, and then it has some instructions. Let's take a peek at the code snippet. Go ahead and open it. All right. It's got some strings. It's got some doubles. We try to parse something. This one uses some uh, fields in order to accomplish it. We have to write a WPF application. So I'd almost rather make this a console app so it was simpler. But we may as well follow the instructions. Notice that if we follow the instructions we're going to have to name our fields exactly what we're expecting or we're going to have to change our code to match. Just a warning. If you get the fields wrong, you name them the wrong thing, then the uh, code, when you copy and paste it, is not going to match. The way you fix it is you change the name of the fields via the properties, or you change the variable names in the code to match. So let's get Visual Studio rocking. We can do this. Oh, that was fast. New, new project. I bet it's going to be a WPF. I don't think I wrote any for Windows Forms. So create a WPF application, and here's what it's supposed to look like. It's going to have two fields. Favorite number. And then it's going to have another one. And then we're going to have some labels, and we're going to have a vote. So what are we going to do? This one is going to be called text input one with an uppercase I, good old camel case. This one's going to be called text input 2. We're going to name the button button calculate. We could probably get away with not renaming a button, but the instructions say, to, say so. And then we're going to change the name of the label to label output. Now when I'm labeling, when I'm giving things variable names, the convention I follow is I put the name of the control there first, followed by a descriptor. So that's why it says button calculate rather than calculate button. Just so that when I'm put, putting up pop-up, you know, lists, you know, using IntelliSense to pick my variables out, if I start to type button and it gives me all the choices, then it's easier to find. Okay, let's make a WPF app. Make it kind of look like that. So it's going to be C sharp. It's going to be a WPF. Which lecture are we on? We're on F. Yeah. 
I probably have to give it a different name because I'm sure I have another Lecture F already, so I'm just going to call it Lecture F Beatles. Don't have to give it a special name. Although Lecture followed by your initials is always cool. Alrighty, so I need those labels. I need a fave number, a fave beetle, and a result. Now this one I'm going to make a special label that has some slash ends in it rather than type in six labels to accomplish that just because that would be tedious. So toolbox. Don't see my toolbox, so view toolbox. Still don't see my toolbox. Where's my toolbox? There he is. Need some labels. That one's going to say fave num. This one's going to say fave beetle. And this is going to be our output. All right, I'm going to use the XML editor and change these things rather than go to properties just for fun. If we have this XML, we may as well take advantage of it. So this first label, I'm going to come down here. And in my XML, it's the first entry in the grid. And so that's content is label. Well, I'm going to change its text. I think it was supposed to say fave number. Favorite number. And that changes it, right? That now says favorite number. This had something else. It has label. And uh, this one was supposed to say... Fave Beetle followed by one is John, Paul, George, Ringo, and who? Okay, so for the second one in the grid, the second label, Fave Beetle colon backslash n, one equals John, backslash n, two equals Paul. That doesn't seem to be doing what I was hoping it would do. I'm not digging the results. I goof that up. Why does it do that? I don't know, and I'm going to undo that. That wasn't working. Sorry for uh, getting ambitious and doing something that wasn't going to work. All right. So I'm just going to go in, find its properties, and I really hope I don't have to create five labels. I apologize for not remembering my own uh, tutorial here. So down here it should say content. Can I type in fave beetle and hit enter? No, okay. Do I give a hint on how to do that in my instructions? I'm not recalling how to do it. What do you know? It says, uh Drag all five. I don't really know how to go. Some of these you. Well, five though meant one, two, three, four, five, oh. six. Okay, but that should say six because I mentioned six. Well, well, well. Why don't we Google how to make a multi line label? WPF. How can I wrap text in a label using WPF? The label control doesn't support text wrapping. You should use a text block instead. Well, really? I, was, I used to be able to do this. Okay, then. 
we have two choices. One is either make six labels or I'm just going to make one long string that says that, right? So going back to my form designer, for the second one, I'm going to make a save. Say Faye Beetle 1 equals John space 2 equals Paul space 3 equals George. Poor Ringo. He's always last. 4 is equal to Ringo. And 5 is equal to who? Question mark. Sizing it doesn't do the trick. Alrighty, well, we have that label there. And then this last one was supposed to say result. I'm going to look at the document to make sure that's exactly what I wanted to say. Result. Yep. Okay. So the last one's supposed to say result. I could change it by going to the properties and choosing content, or I can change it using the XML editor. By the way, if one of y'all students figure out how to make a multi-line label, let me know. I'll edit one of the students from last semester and find out. Anyways, result. All right. Now we have three of our components, but we're supposed to have also two text boxes and a button. I'm just playing with uh, aligning them a little bit. We need a text box here next to favorite number, and we have a tech, need a text box here. Look at the layout again. And a result. So, find text box, make a place for them to type it in. We're going to change the name of the boxes in a minute. We need another text box underneath Faye Beetle. And you know, we could get fancy. I'm going to show you something. You can use blocks. Let me see if I'm spotting it real fast, and if I don't, I'm not going to bother. You ought to be able to group things together. Not spotting it, not going to waste any more time on it. Show you next time. Rectangle. Right? I could draw a rectangle around these things, and yeah, it's covering it up. But then I could probably change the order. I could bring this up to the front. Layout. Well, no, still not spotting it. I'm going to undo it. Order, bring to front. So I drew a rectangle, and then I chose my text, and I chose bring to front. And then I'm going to choose my text box and also bring it to front by choosing order, bring to front. And it's okay if you don't do this. And I could put a box around this other part too, right? I, I could divvy this up like that. Is there a need to? Not necessarily. So I'm going to draw another rectangle so that I can put the favorite number stuff in it. So I drew a rectangle there, and I'm going to click Fave Number, Order, Bring to Front. Click the text box, Order, Bring to Front. Drag those guys up there. Now one more rectangle for the result. So I'm going to drag one more rectangle out. I'm going to click on the result, right click, order, bring to front. Drag this out there on top of that. Maybe stretch it out because I don't remember what text we print. We can change the outlook of this stuff later, the placement and stuff like that. Okay. And we could spend an infinite amount of time working 
depending on the appearance, right? Set a background color for the for the dialogue and stuff like that. I think this is good enough to illustrate the point. Ooh, diagonal. Did I want that? Not really. I'm going to use the cursor keys. I selected it all, and I'm using the cursor key to bring it up like that. I'm not sure why the editor thinks that this division line is so important that that has to be there, so I'm going to ignore that. But I am going to click on the result and the rectangle and move them up with the cursor keys as well. I'm just pressing the up arrow to get it to move. Oh, neat. Now as I resize it, it messes it up. That means that this is kind of anchored against the bottom. So I'm going to move it back down and then I'm going to stop resizing it. Yep, that's messing everything up. Enough. Okay, so as long as we have these text fields, we're three-fourths of the way there. But, or two-thirds of the way there. We need to rename that one. We need to rename that one, and we need to rename the label according to the name specified in the document. So if we go and look, what it wanted us to do is to name the top one text input one, the bottom text box, text input 2, with capitalized in both case, and the button needs to be called button calculate, with a capital C, and the label needs to be called label output. And again, you could change this stuff using the XML. I don't think I will. Maybe I will. What's that first text box? If I click on the text box and then I view the XML editor, it should highlight the line that I'm currently editing can't say that it is, so I'm not going to spend any more time working on that. Maybe if I, you know, zoomed out of my text and stuff like that, it would become very obvious which one it was selecting. Nope, not seeing it, so I'm going to do it via properties. So I'm going to click the text box. I'm going to come over to properties. And I want the name of the control right there up at the very top and I wanted to say text in put one with a capital I I know you can't see that on the screen text input with a capital I one no spaces the next text box is the one under the Beatles name that one text input two so you click it, go into properties. If you can't see properties, then you're kind of stuck. So what you got to do is do view properties. If you can't find them. I'm not even seeing them there, so I hope they're showing. There it is, properties window down there at the bottom. Anyways, we want to change the name of the second input box. Click text box. Change, click on the name field. Text input to. Now I'm making both of my T's lowercase T's. Notice that's not changing the text. That's just changing the name of it. We still have the same text that we did before. We probably want to wipe that text out. We probably want to change this text box initial contents to empty spaces. But I'm, I'm going to skip that until the tutorial tells me to and then I'll add it on as an enhancement later. Okay, we don't even have our calculate button yet. So we're going to grab a button. Oh, wait, but we could rename the result while we're at it. What are we supposed to call the result? We're supposed to call the result label output. That's boring. Ought to be called label result or something like that. But anyways, label output with a capital O, no spaces. So I'm going to select that label. There's no text box next to it, so I'm selecting the label itself. Going over here, and its name is now label output and now we need our button our vote button so I'm gonna come over here to the common controls grab the button drag it out here put it somewhere The text probably needs to be changed to the word vote, and then the name of it needs to be called button vote, I believe. I'm going to double check, not wing it. Okay, yeah, the text is going to be vote. 
and the name of it's going to be button calculate. Again, I'm not sure why it didn't say button vote. If I revise this, the assignment, I would do that. Okay, so this needs, the text of it needs to say, be changed from the word button. And I could find its text down here under content, or I could change it in the XML. You can't change the type of it there, but we can change its content. And the content says vote. So I change that in the content section of the uh, properties. Or you can come down here and find it in the XML and change it that way. We also need to change the name of it to button calculate. So I choose the button, go to properties, in the name field, I call it button with a lowercase b, calculate. Now if you made it in an uppercase b, you just might have to edit the source code when you copy and paste it. So. If you've named these things exactly like I am showing you, then hopefully when we copy and paste the code, it'll work perfectly. Otherwise, you have a little bit of debugging. And quite often, I make intentional mistakes just to show you how to correct them. In this case, I'm trying not to, but it's possible I will. All right. Maybe I want to make the vote button big. All right. Good enough. Maybe I want to put it inside the rec the, this block. In fact, I probably had better. What happens when I run it? I'm curious as to see, to see what it looks like. Yeah, it's kind of off the edge of the screen. I'm going to grab the button, push it in a little, see if I can get it back inside the edge of the screen. Nope, I seem to have messed my margins up. I'm going to move it down underneath the field, rather than take the time to fix it. All right, there, I have a vote button that's in a lame place. I'm going to move it over there and move the result to the other side. Do you need to do all these changes? No. By the way, I'm zooming by using the control key. Control, spin the mouse button up or down. So my result is going to go over here on the right. The button is going to go over here on the left. Move the result back over there. I think I'm going to be happy with the way it looks now. Good enough. All righty. I think we've renamed everything. I think we have all of our controls. So we're going to have to double click the button to create the method, the event handler. And then we're going to go inside the braces. We're going to go open our RTF file and grab the code, copy its contents, and paste. So if you don't already have the FT RTF file open, go and get it. All right, just download it, open it, your favorite way to do so. Then go back to Visual Studio, double click the button, click click, loads up the editor. Here's our button handler, our event handler, button calculate click. That's where my cursor needs to be when I do my paste. I'm going to go back to my RTF. Copy all the code. However you like to highlight everything. The last one just seems to be useless for free. We'll uh, get to that in a minute. And then paste. All right, we have a bunch of code in here. Let's take a look at its structure. Notice that we have these regions. Region string one, end region. Region string two, end region. These are com um, not comments. They're preprocessor directives is what they look like if you've taken C++. And what they do is they control these little plus boxes. Right, so I could uh, just minimize each box to help me keep track of what I'm doing. All right, so what does this do? We declare a couple of strings. One is going to be the input field, the first input field. One's going to contain the second input field, and one's going to contain the output text. And since we want them to type numbers in, we have some variables for holding the number that they typed in. And I'm surprised I made them doubles because they're not supposed to type in 1.5 or whatever, but whatever. I'm going to leave them doubles. 
then we read in the text from the input fields, right? Text input one dot text, text input two dot text. Now, if any of these variables are underlined, it's because that control it does not exactly match the name of it. You'll either have to correct the rename it in the text or you'll go back to the designer and rename it. All right, then we pull the text out. Excuse me, we've already pulled the text out, so we parse it. We change the number, the first field, into D number, double number. We change the second string, the beetle string, the fave beetle string, into another double. Notice the way we do this. Instead of using two Boolean variables, you know, BOK1 and BOK2, we just AND it against the result of the second one. So that if the second one, if the first one failed, then BOK is false. And false AND whatever this is will still be false. So this is going to check out to see whether either one of those conversions failed. Now we could have just created two Boolean variables and use an AND to check it. Okay, so we now we have some strings. And so now down here under region string 1, write an if statement that will compare D number to 10. If greater than 10, set string 1 to greater than 10, else set string 1 to less than 10. All right, we can do that. If parentheses D number greater than 10, Okay, now saying less than 10 is kind of silly because what if it's exactly 10? I've left out a case. But anyways, if D number greater than 10, string 1 equals greater than 10. Now let's do the matching case, even though that doesn't exactly follow the instructions. Else, if D number equals equals 10, String 1 equals equal to 10, end quote, semicolon. Else, now that's really enough. We don't need to say else if D number is less than 10 because that's the only other alternative. So else, string 1 equals, quote, less than 10, end quote, semicolon. All right, now I'm going to run it just to make sure that I don't have any syntax errors in it. There were build errors. What do you know? That was not my intention. No, I do not want to continue and run the last build. Let me go and look at my error list. I've done something wrong. Oh, I see a red box over here in my scroll bar. I'm going to click on it. Well, I better look at the error because I'm not seeing it. Maybe I lost some braces. I think you lost some curly I think I lost some curly braces. Looks like I've lost the end brace for both my method and my class, right? Because there's a class up at the top. So I need to come down here and add one curly brace. Is one enough? I don't have an end region. I need to modify my code, snip it for y'all. We have a begin region, and we don't have a matching end region. Yeah, uh, you're missing some of the code, I think, right? Or no? No? Okay. I have to be. Region string 3 doesn't have a end region. Yeah, it does. I am missing code. I did not copy all the text. That was brilliant. There's a second page of text. If you missed it, go and copy it. I also think I'm missing a, a curly brace, but I'll have to fix that. Okay, so I had a second page of text. I need to go and put it in there. Paste it. Now I have too many curly braces. I'm gonna remove one. And it's giving me a warning now, but that's okay. Okay, so I had some code cleanup to do because I forgot to copy the next block of code. If the same thing happens to you, just go and grab it and then adjust your braces as needed if you need to.
Now the alignment of the braces is goof now because that one should be flush against the border. That one should be over there. That one should be over there. This should be the end of the class. And this one should be the end of button click method. And I don't know what the end of that one is. I'm wrong. I'm going to remove those labels because in s that's actually the end of the namespace and blah, blah, blah. I like to do that, but I'm not going to fix it now. Okay, then. Back up to where we were. We just did this fix. It seemed to compile okay. So I'm going to minimize region string 1. So it's no longer confusing me. In fact, I'm going to minimize all the regions. Then I'm going to open region for string 2. Write an if statement. D number is evenly divisible by 2. If it's true, then set string 2 to even number, else set it equal to odd number. And remember how to calculate if something is ev evenly divisible by 2 or not. You use modulus. Alrighty, so that's a simple if statement. If, and I even, if D num, whoops, D capital M, although the IntelliSense is offering to let me fill it in. Modulus 2 is equal to 0. That means it's an even number. We divided it by 2 and it got no remainder. Then string 2 equals even number, semicolon. And there's only one alternative. It's either even or odd. Else, string 2 equals odd number. And that's it as far as the comments are concerned. So I can minimize re that region. So this is region string 2. I'm going to minimize that one and I'm going to expand string 3. Here's its comment. Write a switch statement that will set sfave accordingly to the name of a beetle based on the value of ifave. Now I made it easy because I did the first case and the default, but we need to go ahead and fill in the rest, right? So switch, we're doing our switch based on our ifave, which is the value that we pulled out from the second text box. Case one, we set our string fave to John and we break, but we need case two, three, and four. Case two colon, not quote, case two colon, sfave equals Paul, followed by a break. Case three. And if some of y'all don't know who the Beatles are, you have homework. Go and listen to some Beatles music. Just kidding. All righty. S fave is equal to George. break, case 4 colon, s fave equals quote Ringo, end quote semicolon, break. So these are the f lines of code that I just added because case 1 was already handled and the default was already handled. The default says Beatles, who are they? That would be so disappointing. Okay. So I'm going to build it just to make sure that I don't have any syntax errors. If you do, pause it and fix them. All right. Then I'm going to minimize that region. Region 3 is now minimized. I'm going to expand region 4. Write a statement with the logic. If sfave is not equal to Ringo, then set string 4 equal to your crazy drummer's rule. Okay, so if parentheses sfave not equal to, so I can use exclamation point equal quote Ringo like that. There's an alternate syntax. I could do this if not sfave equals equals. Both of them work just the same. 
I say that, it doesn't seem to be compiling. So forget that. Undo that. If SFAVE not equal to Ringo, end quote, parentheses, then string four equals your crazy exclamation mark drummer's rule exclamation end quote semicolon now we don't seem to have an else here that must mean that string 4 already has a valid value I'm gonna find out I'm gonna highlight string 4 right click and do go to definition so I, write, I highlighted the variable, I clicked go to definition, and it took me up here. Okay, string 4 is set to an empty string. So if we don't set it to anything else, it's still an empty string. If we didn't initialize it with a value, we'd probably get a syntax error at a certain point. So I don't mind initializing my values every time I declare them. The Java editor of NetBeans complains if you ever initialize a variable and then wind up not using that initializing value. NetBeans is not so harsh. I, I Excuse me. Visual Studio is not so harsh, I believe. All righty. So that was region three, right? No. That's region four. We just fixed string four, uh, string four. So minimize that. I don't know why I have so many spaces between those regions. We don't need to modify that code. If you look at it, it's building an output string, and it's adding string one plus a line feed plus another string plus another new line plus string three plus another new line plus string four plus another new line. You don't need to change any of that. Else we're going to display a message box. Invalid input. Inputs must be numbers. And then S out is equal to invalid input because that's our output string then we set the value of our label, our label's contents, equal to S out. It might work. Maybe we've done enough. Now, I saw, thought I saw a reference to a format command. In my oh, I was supposed to... Uh, I missed a step. Sorry about that. Expand region 3 again. So scroll back up, expand region 3. I did this batch of comments, but I didn't do this batch. Write a statement that will assign to string 3 text that looks like this, including the value of sfave. So, and use string format and a placeholder. Okay. So string 3 is equal to string.format, parentheses, quote, my favorite beetle is, and now I need a placeholder. So curly brace, zero, end curly brace. End quote, comma, and then s fave. Close parentheses, semicolon. Now, I did a line, a line break to make the sentence fit on the page with the text zoomed in like that. You don't have to do that. Put it all in one line. Now, could we have built that string another way? Absolutely. We could have just concatenated the string, right? String 3 equals my favorite beetle, end quote, plus s fave. But I like s string dot format. I want to encourage you to use it. All right. Have we done it all? I hope so. I'm going to run it. All right, favorite beetle. No, favorite number. My favorite number is one, and my fave beetle is George. And now I'm going to click vote. And my label does not seem to match with this rectangle. I have goofed something. I may just delete that rectangle. And it's supposed to say, your favorite beetle is George. You're crazy. Drummer's rule. It didn't seem to do anything with my favorite number. I'm going to have to go back in and look in the code to see if I've made a mistake there. But 
while I'm fixing things. There's my rectangle, but where's my label? Oh, it's hidden under the result button. That's why it didn't work. But I am going to delete that extraneous rectangle. So if you put it there, you can nuke it. All right, as is. Favorite number, 11. Fave beetle, 2. Result, okay, here's all the text. It did take it into account. Favorite number is greater than 10. It's an odd number. That's true. My favorite beetle is Paul, and you're crazy. Drummer's rule. All right, that text is just ridiculous, right? But the point was is to exercise using if statements and case statements, switch statements, and to illustrate, again, reading text in from a text field and writing it out. Okay, there's really only one thing left that I don't like about this app. I don't like that just saying text box. I don't like that saying text box. Maybe I didn't follow the instructions carefully enough. I can fix that in the XML. I can probably even fix that in the code itself. I'm going to come here and see if I can spot where the text boxes are defined. You see where it says initialize component? I wonder what that does. I'm going to right click on initialize component and do go to definition. And woo boy, it's a bunch of stuff. I'm not going to mess with that. I, I, I can, I'm convinced that that's a mistake. So I'm going to fix it back in the XML or with its properties. And I think I'm going to set the color of it so it's easier to spot, right? So where it says text box and text box, I'm going to find the content and blank it out. Why am I not finding it so fast? There it is, text. I'm just going to blank that out. Now I'm going to see if I can find its appearance and change its background to yellow. It hasn't leaped out at me yet. The appearance, right there. Okay. So under brush is appearance. The opacity is 100%. It is visible. Why am I not seeing how to change it's the color? Brush. It's under brush. Okay, brush, background, click on it. Nope, that didn't work. Click on the field. Can't I just pick a color? I had to click on that box and then where it says editor, I had to click that. That one? No, scroll down a little bit more. All right, let me expand this. Yeah. Right. Oh, well, what do you know? All righty. Background, bright yellow, whatever. That's what I want to see. I'm going to do the same thing to this text box. I'm going to find it. I'm going to go and change the text of it. Scroll down here where it says text box. I'm just going to blank it out. Then I'm going to come back up here and try to duplicate that color. That's the last color. That makes it oh, easy. So click on that last color. Now I'm good to go. All righty. And result. We don't really need to see the word result. So I'm going to blank that text out. I'm going to find where it says text. Except this time it's called content rather than text. I'm going to blank that out, and what do you know, it, it made it disappear. Well, there he is. I'm going to stretch that out. All right, so that's my content, my result. Heck, maybe I'll make that one yellow too, but that would make them think that they can click inside it. So I'm not going to fill it in. But it sure would be nice if it had some color just to let us know that it's a movable shape, right? So I'm going to try to make it a very light gray. You don't have to. You don't have to do any of these changes regarding the colors or whatever. All right. Run 
it again. My favorite number is negative two. My favorite beetle is John. I'm gonna vote. Looks like I need to stretch my label out a little bit more now that I've messed it up. Less than 10, even number. My favorite beetle is John. Your crazy drummer's rule. Okay. And I hit something that's trying to load up. CS has been modified outside the source editor. Well, I certainly don't remember doing that, but I'm going to click yes. All right. I'm going to stretch the label out a little bit more. Run it once more time. Try to make it perfect. Invalid input. Inputs must be numbers. All right. One, two. All right. Yay. We got it working. I hope you did as well. If not, at least look at the source code, which are going to be in the daily notes, and make sure you understand how the if statements work, how the, uh, if, you know, how the switch and case statements work, and how we built an output string to stick into that label, and how we read input in from the, why am I pointing up there? You can't see where I'm pointing. How we read stuff from the input text boxes and converted them to numbers to, in order to do some calculations. Now, it's not the first time we've done those things, so I expect that you already understand. All right. That's about enough. Hope it was entertaining and comprehensive. It's still telling me that something is modifying. And eh, well, I'm going to save my project before I get asked that a third time. Close solution. Do you wish to stop debugging? Yes, of course.